Are we set, Chris? Got it. Oh, good, good, good. So I'd like to welcome again, everybody, um, to our talk today. Uh, I put together a couple of things that I found from the internet um, about uh, Ron James. Um, some was from his biography from Amazon. So if you're interested in buying some of his publications, you can just look him up on Amazon. And also I have a quote from uh, when he was interviewed by the Ames Tribune. So um, Ron James is an inductee into the Nevada Writers Hall of Fame in 2014. He is a folklorist and a historian with additional publications in architectural history and archeology. span He was a longtime state historic preservation officer and was appointed to the advisory board for the national park system, at which point he became the chair of the National Historic Landmarks Committee serving for four years. He is, a co he is an author, a co-author, an editor, a co-editor of 15 books, and has authored over three dozen articles in popular and academic journals appearing in six countries. Excuse me, I'm, in, I'm still admitting people. In a quote to, well, lots of people are coming in. So a quote from him in uh, the Ames Tribune, Tribute, sorry, in the Ames Tribute. Uh, he states, I already had some interest in Cornish folklore at that point because I was studying in Nevada and there are a lot of Cornish immigrants there who believe in supernatural beings that live in the mines. The Cornish knockers came to the United States with Cornish immigrants and other miners began to pick up. James also said that folklorists bypass Cornwall because it has been largely left unstudied. Sometimes, yeah, I agree. Sometimes uh, the Cornish get overlooked by the other Celtic, um, uh, the other Celtic uh, nations. Uh, while the Irish, Scottish, Welsh programs maintain extensive folklore archives, no one took care of poor Cornwall, he states. My book seeks to remedy that by putting Cornish folklore in an international context so they can no longer be dismissed so easily. He has degrees in anthropology and history from the University of Nevada, Reno. He was the International Telephone and Telegraph Fellow in Ireland from 81 to 82, studying at the Department of Irish Folklore at University College Dublin. In 2016, James was inducted as the Bard of the Gorseth Colonel, the Bardic Council of Cornwall, in recognition of his work on Cornish immigration and folklore. So I'd like to welcome Ron James. Take it away. Okay, well, well, thank you for that. That's very generous. I, I hope you're now hearing me after all of our technical. Okay, that's, that's a good sign. I, I'm gonna launch into the PowerPoint if that's okay. Um, so I'll just, I will try this transition and let's hope that uh, it doesn't send us to someplace other than Cornwall. So, um, are you? Yep. Okay. Well, and then yeah. just put it into in the um, slideshow mode. Yep. There yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm I'm trying. <laughs> it wasn't there. Okay. Now does that fill up everyone's screen? It's still coming up. There we go. Excellent. Okay. There. Good. 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 Yeah. I. Uh, th th that's very generous uh, introduction. The the fact is. I uh, came to Cornish folklore in a in a backward way, um, I uh, and I can tell you that my at least my initial evaluation of Cornish folklore was not a matter of Cornish pride. Growing up, I was told that I was Welsh, and uh, and I only later found out that my gr grandmother Genoeth was Cornish. And I was astonished. I don't know if you knew that, but I found out that was a Cornish name. I was, but I rather late in the, rather late in the game. Um, so, uh, but because of that, I can act, honestly say that my evaluation of Cornish folklore is, is a is an objective truth. That it's not something that I is simply beating one's chest. At least at the outset. Now that I understand I'm Cornish, I can take a lot of pride in it. But initially, that was not what it was. It was it was just something that I came to realize as I made my way through the material. And my first encounter, as, as the gracious introduction indicated, was, 
was that the, the uh, by means of the American Tommyknocker, I was I grew up in in the mining west, and I heard about this American Tommyknocker that uh, we'll discuss later. But it started me interested in all things Cornish, Cornish immigrants, and Cornish folklore. When I went to Dublin, Ireland, to study at the Irish Folklore Archives, uh, I encountered a fantastic library. Uh, 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 that was actually fairly old, because even though the program dated to after the Irish Revolution, the uh, my mentor's mentor, Carl Wilhelm von Sudoff in Sweden, donated his fourteen thousand volume library to to the Irish archives, and as a result of that, there's all sorts of wonderful volumes from the turn of the century and into the uh, the thirties and forties when his career was active in Sweden. Uh, it included a lot of Cornish folklore books. So I just started reading them. I had the interest in mining folklore and th there were the books right there. So I, I encountered them. And honestly, I was uh, really astonished by what I found because it, it was a, a great collection of material. The, the thing is, it was also being ignored. And I was very aware of that because of the uh, circumstance of the um, being part of the uh, 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 one of the best archives in in the world, the Irish Folklore Archives, and how little the Cornish folklore was was uh, granted any attention. And I really came to the conclusion, and have come to the conclusion over the years, that this is because of two things. The first is that it's generally perceived to be English. And all things English from the point of view of folklore tends to be, international folklore studies tends to be ignored. Uh, the English somehow were perceived as not having real folklore and the Cornish were perceived as being English. Therefore, Cornwall can't have real folklore. Certainly it's not worth our time. Uh, the second thing is that, that the earliest collectors uh, of Cornish folklore were working with the, the droll tellers, the, the Cornish storytellers. And they record them as saying that they altered the material uh, as they went. And so that defeated the main purpose of early uh, folklore studies. Folklore was intended to find ancient remnants, the, the things that were preserved in oral tradition that honored the tradition. And here in Cornwall, we have droll tellers who did anything but honor tradition. They, they altered it as, as they went. And so from the point of view of 19th century and, and even early 20th century folklorists, how could this be worth anything? Because they altered it. So it would, would be not worth your time if, if, you, if you were to, to um, work with that idea. So uh, the, any hope that they could cap, uh, capture gems from this ancient time was defeated by the very droll tellers who were telling the stories. So from the point of view of international folklore studies, this was not worth their time and they looked all right past it. And that, that, that was the, the, the irony, the conundrum that I, I found when, when I started looking at these early, um, these early remnants of, uh, of Cornish folklore and how that would fit in. So um, as I looked at it, I found that there was a considerable library of Cornish folklore available and, uh, and yet it was ignored. I, I studied in Dublin under a great folklorist by the name of Bo Onkvist, part of the peculiar Swedish Irish connection that, that plays out in, in regional folklore studies. And he was, he's written, he wrote, he's now deceased. He wrote extensively on North Sea cultures. And he frequently compared the folklore of Scotland, Ireland, the Isle of Man, Wales, and Brittany with Scandinavia, completely jumping over England, because after all it's English. But in the mix of things, he ignored Cornwall as well. In spite of the fact that in his very own archive, there were all these wonderful Cornish books on, on Cornish folklore. Uh, it, it just, it struck me as, as just hard to fathom why this was occurring or why it should occur. And it, it also, I felt, meant that it needed to be fixed. An added irony to all this is that folklore studies has really 
shifted over the years so that today folklorists tend to look at traditions in the context of the time and place. They, there's a lot less interest in pursuing ancient roots. And so the fact that Cornish folklore has changed would mean nothing of any significance. It's just fine. So what? You just look at it the way it is today. And yet, despite the fact that this is, has become the standard of modern folklore studies to consider folklore as it is, is expressed at this moment, the old prejudice still linger and Cornish folklore seem to still be ignored. Now, all this inspired me to take a very careful look at the droll tellers. Here we see one of our, our last of the classic droll tellers, Henry Quick. Uh, and uh, and, he, and he, he's a, one of the best documented of the uh, droll tellers, although there's surprisingly good information about many of them. And, uh, but the droll tellers were uh, professionals, which is very unusual in Europe. Uh, there are uh, only a few cultures had professional storytellers. They, they really boil down to Ireland, Scotland, Wales on a good day, and Cornwall. That's really it. It's surprising. They, they didn't really occur in Scandinavia nor Iceland. Uh, they aren't found in England. Uh, these are the places in Northern Europe where you, you encounter professional storytellers. And, uh, and that's in itself is pretty remarkable. But then if you look at what Corn the Cornish droll tellers were professing to do and what they, they apparently really thrived on doing was uh, um, being creative. And also they were really remarkable for their rhymes. And you could argue that they were kind of the rappers of their time. They, they were, really were uh, uh, something special that has been largely ignored. By the, by the rest of the uh, folklore studies. Mm. Uh, this epiphany that the droll tellers were, were what was best about Cornish folklore is not something that, that and th that they're not something that needed to be apologized for may, may seem obvious to many, but from a folklorist point of view, this was reversing over a century of scholarship and, and the, the very idea that storytellers should be recounting stories as close to how they heard them so that you could trust that they were ancient, ancient tra traditions. And, you know, in spite of the fact that here we are um, appreciating folklore for what it is in its own time, and yet here, and yet they, uh, uh, they were given their time, their due for what they were doing. Now, uh, I started after I took a look at this role that the, uh, the droll tellers were playing, and I started asking questions about how this affected the, the folklore, the, the traditional folklore that they were inheriting and then passing on. And while mining had brought me to Cornish folklore, I soon realized that the, the sea is omnipresent and it was the really critical thing in the whole thing. Cornwall is, after all, has been described many times by scholarship uh, is nearly an island and its maritime industry was pivotal. So I started looking at the effect of the sea on, on Cornish folklore and I found over and over again the ramifications. You start with uh, the, the famous Lenore legend, uh, which uh, describes a, a, a young woman who's mm -hmm wondering why her, her husband hasn't returned uh, from, from war or, or from some far off place. And he finally comes one night on a horse and, and invites her off so that they can spend all eternity together. And she gets on the back of his horse and rides off only to find that he is taking her to his grave because he's dead. In Cornwall, the horse often becomes a boat. So it has transformed this legend that's all over Northern Europe and, uh, and changes the horse for a boat. In the same way, there's a widespread legend about, uh, a, uh, about a, a man who steals a cup from the fairies. They, he, he sees them partying and he, they offer him a drink. He recognizes that it's poison. He throws it out he and he's on horseback. He takes the cup and he, he rides off 
uh, at, with the fairies in quick pursuit. Um, it's the story that uh, inspired Robert Burns' Tam O'Shanter, actually. Uh, and this is all, again, all over Europe, always involving a horse, except on Cor in Cornwall, the, th the thief of the, of the fairy cup frequently escapes by boat. Once again, the, the sea has affected the story. And then uh, there's another very common European legend of a farmer uh, who has built a cow shed and some fairies come to him and say, would you mind moving your cow shed because our kitchen table is right underneath your cow shed and the, what automatically comes with cow sheds is dripping down on our table and we don't appreciate it. So the farmer recognizes that he uh, to avoid any trouble because when you aggravate fairies there, there can be quite a bit of trouble. He moves his cow shed. In Cornwall, this, this manifests as a mermaid asking a ship's captain to move his anchor because it is blocking the door to her home. And once again, the influence of maritime ha has caused the droll tellers to change the story to fit Cornwall. So this brings us back to our, uh, the, the knocker, the Tommy knockers and the knockers that were my initial inspiration. And the, the Cornish knocker is like other entities throughout Britain, sometimes uh, called knockers because they of what the sounds are, are like underground when you hear timbers creaking, they're kind of knocking. And so that was how the these little underground ferries would communicate with miners. And uh, the, that, that name is common throughout Britain, but it's the Cornish knockers that are, are, are most important because we have their, their traditions recorded and the Cornish seem to really excel at telling stories about, about their knockers. And so uh, they would, the knockers would warn of danger or sometimes lead miners to, to wealth. And that was uh, the tradition as it was in Cornwall. What had initially attracted me to the whole tradition, this whole phenomenon, and by that, because of that, into Cornish folklore in general, was that um, that the, these knockers, these Cornish knockers, had made the transition to the United States, to North America, and that's very rare. Fairies almost never survive immigration. And when they do, they almost never thrive in the new world. And yet the Cornish uh, knockers did both. And what's more, the, uh, not only did it thrive within the Cornish community, it, it spread out throughout the mining West among miners who weren't even Cornish. And that is just unheard of. You get a few little pockets of European ferries, of Nova Scotia, the, uh, you get some people, uh, descendants of immigrants who tell the stories, but the idea that they should not only sur survive and thrive, but then diffuse into the larger population is just shocking. It's, it simply never, never occurs. I, I was giving a presentation uh, about 15 years ago uh, to a group of people, and there was one old fellow there uh, who said he had had a, an experience with knockers. And I thought, well, that's, that's really something. And, you know, and he told his story that he had been drinking uh, and decided to go off into uh, the, the Golconda mine in, in Nevada and uh, into one of the lower levels that was abandoned and, and try to sleep it off. And when he woke up, he heard some creaking and he knew that they were Tommy knockers and he was terrified. Uh, he knew this largely because his father had told him about the Tommy knockers and, and his father was a believer. And, and he said, you know, at that moment, he certainly had become a believer himself. And he was really uh, quite take, shaken by the whole experience. And so I asked him, I, I, I expected him, him to answer, I, uh, yes. I, I said, no, so are you Cornish? And he said, no, no. And he, I said, well, what was your father? And he said, oh, he was Portuguese. And that's a good example of how the, the Cornish knocker became the American Tommy knocker and became something of uh, international belief and folklore. It's, it's widespread in the American West and it's not uh, restricted to just Cornish Im immigrants. And that is really, it, it's just shocking that that should uh, have occurred that way.
So I finally understood the process that it set, it set off my initial curiosity dating back to the 1970s actually. And, and I could have left it off at that point. I, I write books to answer questions that the existing literature does not address. Honestly, I'd much rather check out a book than write one. Uh, it's a lot easier to check out a book. Writing a book, that takes a long time and a lot of, a lot of effort. Reading one, much easier, much easier. So uh, at that point, I could have left it behind and said that uh, that's enough. But at this point, maybe a, because of a certain amount of Cornish pride and, and, uh, and a delight in Cornish folklore, because of that, I decided to pursue it a little bit more. And after I published my book on, on, the, on Cornish folklore, which uh, actually came out in early 2019, now uh, almost, almost three years ago, uh, I, I decided to continue to do a little bit more. And one of the things I did was to compare, I uh, decided to use what I had, had, the tools that I had developed in this book to do a comparison. I, I was curious to see whether, uh, how Cornish folklore measured up to that of Devon, its, it's, its next door neighbor. And so I, I took a look at, at pixie legends from both of these, uh, these neighbors and uh, did, did a comprehensive comparison. And you can see from the map that uh, I developed Western and Eastern variants. And it, it just simply turned out, and this was an article I published in, the, in Folklore, which is the Journal of the uh, the Folklore Society that's uh, founded in London, uh, I, I found out that there was a little bit of diffusion in the Tamar Valley separating Devon and Cornwall, but basically the Eastern variants are the Eastern variants and the Western variants are the Western variants and there wasn't a lot of movement between the two. So there wasn't diffusion as much as you might expect over the Tamar and the Cornish variants were distinct from the Devonian ones. Now, I, I don't know whether we'd want to call the Devonian ones English, but they definitely aren't Cornish. And Cornish folklore is definitely not English. That was the conclusion I was able to draw from this evidence. Now, this, this analysis relied on a comparative uh, method that I used in my book. And it's, it's not for everyone. It doesn't suit everyone or every pro a problem, but it does, provide a, a demonstration of its value. The, my book provides international folklorists with a means to reach into the Cornish material and raise it up when they conduct their studies. Something that the folklorists I studied under Bo Onkvist uh, did not do. And maybe if he had had my book, he could have looked at it because it has a tail type index at the back. It is a means for international folklorists to finally look at Cornwall and not simply ignore it the way they might. I then took a look at, uh, at another way to treat it, which does not deal with this, uh, this older approach. It's, and, it, and it was uh, something that was needed for a more contemporary subject, na namely the more gaur, the, the, which means sea creature. Um, this was a, a sea serpent that was identified in 1976. It was actually a hoax conceived by uh, Tony Doc Shields, who was a performance artist working with a local journalist. And the, uh, the Morgauer, as they called him, uh, fit into it very well. It was a complete hoax, but it, it has excited international cryptologists, and now it's created its own body of folklore. So this is another approach, another way to take a look at folklore, and Cornish folklore especially. And this always begs the question whether there actually are sea serpents swimming in Cornish waters. You know, and the answer is, I don't know. And that ain't my job. I don't, I, don't, I don't deal with that. The important thing here is how a hoax created its own tradition and because sometimes folklore does, simply doesn't have deep roots. This and other work points toward a sequel volume, a second book to consider even more ways to deal with Cornish folklore. And that's something I'm now toying with writing, but one never takes on the writing of a book lightly. It's, uh, it's a lot of work. And, and so I'll see if I have another book in me. I hope so. Uh, so the question then is, where does this leave us? Well, fortunately, a growing number of people are, are delving into Cornish folklore. 
And these range from modern performing droll tellers because the dro droll telling has not died. Cornwall is alive and well with storytellers yet today, as well as a, a wide variety of writers and bloggers who are considering this body of tradition from many different angles. And that's good. I published an article in the most recent volume of Cornish Studies, which is so recent I haven't seen it yet, uh, entitled uh, The Many Paths to Cornish Folklore. Because of this, indeed, the best thing about how people interact with our, our, our traditions is the diversity. They address them in, in ways that suit them, and that's something to be encouraged. I have approached Cornish folklore in a variety of ways, and certainly my path is not for everyone. But that said, without the comparative method that I offer, uh, I, I can guarantee you that the traditions of Cornwall would continue to be ignored internationally. I hope I've opened the door for the rest of the world to have a look. Those of us who are Cornish maybe don't care if the rest of the world has a look because we can just enjoy Cornwall for ourselves. But on the other hand, they should, they should at least look, look, be able to look in on Cornwall and appreciate the fantastic material that has been collected for now over 150 years. But this is only my path. Cornish folklore thrives because so many have, have taken an interest. And this, like the Morgauer, demonstrates that there will always be new traditions because folklore never dies. Everyone has folklore, and that'll be true for Cornwall 100 years from now. We can conclude, therefore, by asserting that the state of Cornish folklore is very good, if we can accept this as a state of the, the Union for, or uh, speech for Cornish folklore. It is very good. And in fact, it has never been healthier or more vibrant. And that's thanks to everyone, you know, the, all, all the work that you do, all the work that so many people are, and all the celebration of Cornish folklore that is now part, integral to the way we experience Cornwall in itself. So that is my presentation. I am going to stop sharing because I see the little red button that was so elusive when I tried to set this up. There we go. Have I stopped, have I stopped sharing? Do we see one another now? Yes, we do. I see a thumbs up for those of us who are still here. Christopher, I think we accomplished it. We did. Good job. Okay. I don't know whether I can get out of this. Oops. Ended slideshow. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So if I suppose at this point, is somebody going to take over monitoring this and tell people they should begin talking themselves because they're all tired of hearing me talk? I'll do my best. <laughs> I see that Heather has her hand up. Yes, Heather, do you want to go ahead? Sure. I just wanted to thank you. This is delightful. Um, and I, I was also wondering, um, the Cornish Piskies, uh, they, they have certain qualities in the Cornish legends that they don't really have elsewhere. Do you, do you mind talking a little bit about um, sort of some of the Cornish variants? Sure. And, you know, I, I that was the, the article I wrote, which was comparing the, and I, I defaulted my apologies to the, the internationally preferred term uh, pixie because, uh, you know, because that's the way we have to do it sometimes. But uh, obviously we would prefer to use the word pisky. And so thank you for reminding us all of that. But uh, comparing just the, the piskies with the pixies of Devon, I found that in general, they were, they were very similar. And I'm not sure that if you looked at them as entities, you would notice a great deal of difference. Uh, there has been some evidence and some observations that, that they tend to um, uh, engage in, being, uh, in, in uh, doing pixie lead uh, for people. P people tend to be more pixie lead in Devon than they are in Cornwall. Uh, they, they can be pixie led in either place, but the, the, the Devonians seem to really focus on that aspect, which I think, uh, why? I don't know. Uh, in general, they behave very similarly. And uh, in fact, you have, you have to understand that the piskies or pixies or whatever you want to call them are part of a very broad tradition of, of Northern European fairies that extends from Ireland to Sweden and from Brittany to Iceland. So this is a very widespread tradition. 
They are social beings. They live in communities and they live in families. They live in groups and they function in that regard so that it, when people are described interacting with them, they often encounter a husband and a wife and children, or if they are actually in a royal court, there will be a king and a queen and their, and their courtiers. That doesn't occur elsewhere in Europe. Uh, in, in, elsewhere in Europe, they will be, they may appear in, in twos or threes, but they act as single individual, uh, they act as a collective. They don't have individuality. The, the, the group hand, interacts with people as a single entity. So what's going on in Northern Europe is really strange. And uh, it's rare internationally in the rest of the world, uh, the, this approach. So first we have to understand that the Piskies fit into this <laughs> odd but widespread Northern European tradition. And differences can be slight. Now we know uh, by tradition that the Piskies and Pixies are small, but we also know if we look at the legends that they frequently interact with people in human sized form. So all of these entities can frequently appear human sized or they can appear small. And sometimes and in Cornwall, we even see them uh, grow up and to become threatening giants. So uh, size is a flexible thing, and that's common throughout Northern Europe. Some Northern Europeans perceive them more, more often than not as small, and others perceive them as more often in human size. But uh, the, the Piskies fit into that very nicely. They also are the Cornish, traditional Cornish stories about Piskies fit, use many of the same legend types that you can find in Norway, or Ireland, or Scotland, or Iceland. Uh, it's, so these legend types were fit in too. But what I found with, with my comparative analysis was that while they fit in, the way the droll tellers told the stories about the Piskies tended to have their own individual Cornish stamp. So were they remarkably different from elsewhere? Not generically, not looking at their general features. Were the stories told about them different? And the answer is yes. That, that, that'll teach you for asking a question. I think that was way too long, but uh, okay, that thumbs up. I got two thumbs up. That's good. Thank you. Wesley? Right, we, there you go. About uh, 15 years ago in the Journal of the Royal Institution of Cornwall, there was a an article that I found very disturbing. Um, it was about fairy children. And um, th this is a situation in which a child is perceived to have been swapped, that, that the fairies have taken the human child and replaced the human child with a fairy child. And the response of the human parents is to abuse the child as much as possible in, to the point of actually killing the child. Uh, is this, how, how widespread is that? It's, is that just uh, Cornwall? No, sadly it was, it was extremely widespread. And uh, yeah, it, it, this is, a, in fact, there's a legend type that is common not only in Northern Europe, but it's, you find it elsewhere. Uh, Martin Luther uh, described it in Germany. Uh, and it's the story of the changeling uh, where uh, the fairies, uh, abduct a human infant, usually a boy, they always prefer boys, they were very sexist about this, and uh, they, uh, they would abduct a, a, a baby boy and replace him with their, their own, uh, can be, that was made to look like a, a baby, but then it didn't thrive. And so the, usually there, there were two uh, type sub-variants of this legend. One was that they would do something to astonish the baby into talking, uh, brew beer in an eggshell or something like that. And the other was to abuse the baby. And uh, either way, the, the, the mother of the, uh, the, the woman who, uh, the fairy woman who abducted the baby would return with the baby and, and say, uh, I never abused your, your baby and yet you did this to, to ours. And you know, you're not a very nice person, but here's your baby and I'm taking mine. And so that would be it. That's very common throughout European folklore. 
and it clearly manifests in real cases of abuse. Fairies also were prone to take, taking adults, uh, and they, in, with adults, they tended to focus on adult women. And there's a very uh, famous case of Bridget Cleary, the, uh, the, the killing of Bridget Cleary in, in Ireland in 1895, where a husband was convinced that his wife had been abducted by the fairies and this lethargic uh, thing that they had left was in fact a, 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 something that was mag magically made to look like his wife. And so he decided to burn her, believing that she was probably a, a wooden log that was magically imbued with her, his wife's features. And so he burned his wife and was tried for murder and convicted by, uh, by an English Irish court uh, because you just can't be doing that kind of thing. But clearly the folklore could inspire that kind of abuse if they really did believe that, that there was an abduction involved and that the only way to get it reversed would be to abuse the, the thing that was left. And there's been a great deal of study on this as to whether this was a common uh, remedy for uh, various disabilities or other congenital problems that manifest with babies. Sometimes they aren't exactly, sometimes these issues aren't ex uh, immediately apparent upon birth, but seem to manifest after three or four months when the baby isn't progressing the way uh, the majority of babies do. And so it did probably inspire a great deal of abuse. It's very sad and unfortunately very real, not confined at Cornwall, Although Evan Wentz, uh, when he did his collecting right after the turn of the century, uh, recorded some instances of, of families that, that knew of other people where this had, this had occurred, where a, a, some baby with some sort of disability had been had abused of, in some way. Yeah, the article had uh, actually uh, maybe 15 instances in Cornwall, you know, enumerated. Of, of specific cases, it's horrifying to read. Yeah, yeah. Well, multiply that times uh, all the other countries, and you'll you can imagine that this happened hundreds, if not thousands, of times over the years. Uh, you know, and it's it's one of the sad byproducts of of a folkloric explanation of a really a very uh, common phenomenon. You know, it's thank sad. you. Yeah. Well, Catherine. Had, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just hoping that somebody had a, a question that would lead us not to, to such dark circles. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I wanted to ask Ron, other than the abductions and the changeling and so forth, what you refer several times to the interactions that people have had with Piskies. What what are you referring to? What sorts of interactions have people had? Well, um, yeah, the, th the thing about it is people believe that Piskies were around them. You know, the traditional European culture believed that the fairies were amongst them. And, uh, and they believed that they, they uh, would manifest in a wide variety of ways. Sometimes they would see them out of the corner of their eyes. You know, and we all have seen that kind of odd thing and where you turn and then there's nothing there. Well, it, if you're a believer, then that becomes a pixie uh, or easily becomes a pixie or, you know, or a ghost or an angel. But, you know, whatever is forefront in your mind, you'll, you can see, you can interpret odd things. And you go out at night uh, in a pre-industrial society and rural area, it's, things are really dark and they can be spooky and there's noises in the dark. Uh, and you can interpret that very easily to be piskies. Underground, the, the underground uh, piskies, because that's basically what the knockers were. They were simply piskies, uh, underground mining piskies. Uh, they would manifest with the, the sounds underground. And I, I've, I've been underground in a mine and it, it's a pretty terrifying, spooky place. And your senses get heightened and every single noise you're very much aware of because it, it may be hinting at 
the, the last thing you're going to hear. So you're, you're going to treat it with respect. And uh, so there's another example of where the Piskies uh, came very, um, very much a, a matter of reality. And not only that, they, uh, you could think of them as a, as a really valuable tool, not just a whimsical belief. But if you're underground, you better be listening for all sorts of subtle signals that danger may be afoot. If you can look at those dangers as a personification, as, uh, that they're actually personified by something that's supernatural and therefore uh, tuned into things in a more uh, real way, then that, that, that gives you a means to say, that, that isn't just a sound, that's a sound from the Piskies and I better respect it. If, if you remove the belief, if you can do a mental exercise where you re remove that belief and you have a sound occurring, would you, would you necessarily treat it with the same degree of respect? You might say, there's a sound, I don't know what to make of it. As opposed to, there's a sound, I think it's the Piskies, I better respect it. Uh, so, you know, it, you can see how it actually could function uh, and I think that could be taken too far because folklore doesn't necessarily have to have a function, but it could, it could really help a miner uh, survive uh, being underground by actually believing in underground piskies. Now that doesn't really answer your question. They would see it, the piskies, uh, uh, evidence of the piskies and in a wide variety of ways. And they believe that they could encounter them all the, at any time. On top of that, I think it's also important to point out, and this goes back to the, the darker aspects of the changeling, that people were always afraid of the Piskies. We think of them in, in whimsical uh, Tinkerbell-ish terms, uh, but they were not Disneyfied at that point. Disney had not had his way with them. They were terrifying. The, the fairies of Northern Europe were dangerous and they were capricious. They could be, they could, uh, do good things by you if they chose to, but they could turn on a dime. And when they did, they were extremely dangerous. So you feared them and you were better off not interacting with them at all. So uh, while they were always believed they might interact with them, they always feared they might interact with them. So it, it set up a complex. I, I don't know if I answered your question though. Did I, I've wandered all over the place. I think I've danced around your question. Do you want to follow up with something so that I focus more? No, that was what I was wondering, just in conversations you've had with people who have evidenced some sort of a, an interaction. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, to be fair, I've done more of that kind of interacting with believers in Ireland uh, because I, I was there for a year. Uh, and, and didn't do as much work in Cornwall. And when I did, I did not run into any believers at that point in the 1980s. In the, 19, in the early 1980s, I ran into believers in Ireland. I knew people who had seen a banshee uh, uh, and just before the death of a loved one. Uh, I, uh, I knew this one uh, young student uh, who was from County Kerry and she was studying in Dublin. And I asked her if she believed and she said, I, she said, I don't believe when I'm here in Dublin, but I do believe when I go back home. And she was astonished in a, in a lot of ways about that. I think she, was, she, she couldn't quite understand why, she, why the belief turned on when she went back to Kerry, but when she came to Dublin, somehow the belief turned off. And in the course of the conversation, I said, uh, I was asking her, do you believe in this? Do you believe in this? I said, do you believe in, in UFOs? And she laughed and said, oh no, that's, that's what you Americans believe in. So we all have our beliefs. That was not, that was, a, she drew the line on something that silly. So I think that was, a, <laughs> we'll, we'll end with that. Nicholas. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, th thanks for that. Uh, presentation in the talk. I thought it was really fascinating. Um, I had a couple of questions, so maybe I can ask them uh, sort of in, in succession or and we'll get to them when, when we can. Please. But um, so the first one had to do with bukas um, in Cornish folklore. And I'm wondering about 
um, the buka as a creature and maybe as um, related to knockers or, or quite distinct. I understand, you know, bukas were thought of as also sometimes inhabiting mines and coastal areas and, and whatnot. Um, just wondering if you had some ideas on that. Yeah, that, that's just one of the names they would use for uh, the, the knockers. Yeah, they would. And it seems to be related to uh, our, uh, to the word puck, uh, apuka, uh, but Puck that is, appears in, in uh, Shakespeare's plays, but Puka uh, elsewhere. Uh, it also may be related to the, what becomes our boogeyman, uh, but Buka is just a, was a word that what they would use to as a name for knockers. Knocker, the name knocker is descriptive, so it really isn't a proper name, but Buka seems to be something closer to a proper name. But we also have to be on our guard against the effect of perception that we have as a result of all the handbooks of elves, fairies, and hobgoblins and whatever, these handbooks that have been published at, over and over again in the 20th and 21st century that say, this entity is this, and this entity is that. The folk mind, the, the, the original pre-industrial folk tradition did not have a handbook of all these different things. They became blurred together. They were, they, and so there were no finely defined entities with finely defined names. Buka was Knocker, Knocker was Buka, except on the second Tuesday of the third month of the year. You know, uh, so, you know, these things could, were, were more amorphous than then all those handbooks, the way they make us perceive things in exact terms, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Um, yeah, and if I could ask another question, I don't see any other hands up yet. Um, so uh, so I, my other question had to do with, I mean, you mentioned this kind of time period when there was not a lot of literature available and certainly not being um, stocked on the shelves of, of a lot of libraries and whatnot regarding Cornish folklore. And I'm, I suppose I'm just wondering, you know, you mentioned Betrell, and, and I'm wondering about other 19th century scholars like, you know, Sabine Baring Gould or, or Margaret Courtney or George Gardner, um, Cecil Sharp, these sorts of folks who, who were writing, who were they writing for? And then how did we end up with this time period where, where these things, you know, get lost or are not really paid attention to um, no, that's for a so good, long? And you missed, you missed Robert Hunt, who also is... Uh, did wonderful work as well. Mm -hmm. All those early collectors are the reason why we can say that Cornwall uh, has a competitive amount of recorded folklore, published folklore, when, when compared to any of the English counties, and really competitive when you look at Wales or Scotland. Uh, Ireland's a different kettle of fish. Ireland had uh, incredible professional collecting for, and has had for over a century. And so Ireland is just in a league of its own. But in Britain proper, uh, Wales and, uh, and Scotland have uh, maybe as much as, as Cornwall, but they're, they're more populated, let's face it. And so for Cornwall with its population to have as much as it does outclassing any of the English counties, uh, I think you know, our hats off to what they did accomplish and published all that. And yet it was ignored. Uh, you will see more tendency to do have comparative analysis of a European folklorist for Wales and Scotland, and to a certain extent, even Brittany, but Cornwall ignored. And it, like I said, it's because of the perception that it was English and therefore was to be discounted. It had been ruined. Even Nance talked about how the loss of the Cornish language ruined Cornish folklore. And he was flat out wrong on that score. And yet that's the perception. And then the added to that, of course, is the fact that Droll Teller said, hey, you know, we changed everything. Well, you know, and here you have Irish, the, uh, uh, the, the Irish professional storyteller saying, I repeat our, the things I heard word for word well, did they? Probably not. But they said they were, that was their goal, that they were trying to repeat things word for word. And therefore, when you heard an Irish storyteller tell you a story, you could hear the ninth century. And when you heard a Cornish troll teller tell you a story in 1860, you might be hearing uh, 1858. 
<laughs> you know, so they, because they changed it all, the whole way. And, you know, so that caused a certain amount of uh, dismissal of the whole thing. And it's, it's, it's sad. And I, I made the point that within the Irish folklore archives, there are tens of thousands of pages of English language Irish folklore because not everyone spoke Irish. And the Irish folklore collectors recorded a great deal that was in English. Was that English folklore? Well, I should think not. It's obviously Irish folklore. It just happens to be in the English language. So is Cornish folklore English? No, it's Cornish folklore. It just happens to be recorded in English. And yet the international community ignored it and brushed it off as, as English and, and mutated and therefore of no consequence. And did you have another follow-up question? I, I know I see that Marion has a question, so we wanna make yeah. sure. It That's isn't great. exactly, yeah. Uh, it isn't exactly a question, but going back to sticking to the traditional stories, uh, each each of these, uh, the Piskies or the Knockers or the um, Spriggans, they have their own history and their own personalities. And what I used to do quite a bit of storytelling. I'd try to stick to the story that we knew. Um, I once had a, a person that was writing a, a children's um, book and uh, set in, um, in the lead region. And uh, she had knockers in the story and she wanted to know how the knockers acted and their habits and so forth. And I gave her a bunch of material. And when the book came out, uh, there were women and children knockers. And I don't think that <laughs> yeah. I was more than a little upset. <laughs> yeah. And the, the, the fact is that they, throughout Northern Europe, the, the fairies of their various sorts reflect what what people did. So they did, people lived in families, the fairies lived in families, and the Piskies lived in families and lived in communities just like people did. But in the mines, the Cornish were very resolute about the fact that you women did not go into the mines and, and, uh, and traditionally neither did children. So were there women and children knockers? Well, no, not traditionally. And and uh, not no, in any mine I've ever been in. Uh, they didn't know they, they would simply that would have been uh, shockingly wrong. And in fact, there was a great deal of folklore that prohibited women from uh, coming into mines. They were bad luck. And mm -hmm. I, it, it, you know, of course, it, it stands the reason that if you saw a redhead when you're walking out to the mine, you better turn around because that's certainly bad luck. A redheaded woman. I mean, there's nothing more bad luck than that. After all, and so yeah, yeah, the, the idea that that there would be women uh, and and children piskies is is not of anything that would be regarded as Cornish tradition. No, <laughs> but thank you for telling us about that. But let's hope we never hear one again. <laughs> thank you for your presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Nicholas, did you have another question? I'm, I'm sorry. Um, not in particular, but I mean, I guess if we've got the, the time, I, I mean, I'm interested in, in your response about these early um, writers. And I, I, I'm just for a point of clarification, are you sort of suggesting that when they were writing, they write these books and, and just nobody really seems to care? Or, I mean, is there a time when, when they're, you know, accepted as something worth reading and then they just kind of fade into obscurity? The British, the, the Folklore Society uh, that was organized in London, one of the oldest in the world, uh, it was really, I, I'd say that in general, the membership was very excited by what was going on in Cornwall. And they, they, were, they gave them their due. And, and in, though in the English speaking British folklore tradition, they were, counted as extremely important to the effort that was going on in Britain and excellent examples of all of that. Internationally, folklore studies 
bypassed a lot of what was going on in England. Uh, it came out of the studies originated in Europe and Germany with Jakob Grimm and it tended to go north into Scandinavia where it inspired a, a, the school of study out of Finland of all places, which also then was adopted by the rest of, uh, by all the Scandinavian countries. And then thanks to my mentor's mentor, Carl Wilhelm von Sudoff, it jumped over to Ireland where, and my mentor Sven Lilleblad helped organize the Irish folklore archives in the late eight, 1920s. Uh, so the Swedish Irish connection made sure that that was going well. And all of that resulted in British folklore studies going its own path and look, being largely uh, isolated from the rest of folklore studies. So international folklore studies tended to be continental and Scandinavian and, and became very fascinated with the Celtic fringe. That did not include Cornwall from their perspective for the reason that it had become too English and was not traditional enough. And, and as a result, I think that it's fair to say that the British folklore studies, for all they were and were not, continued to have a great deal of respect for Cornwall, but they didn't, they were, British folklore studies traditionally wasn't really strong on comparative analysis, the way that the continent Scandinavia and the Celtic fringe was. So it tended to be ignored by the rest of that. And most of the folklore literature, and then that became the way the North, the, the North American approach was the continental approach. It was heavily influenced by the Scandinavians and, and the continent, rather than the British folklorists. So all of that resulted in kind of an international conspiracy against Cornwall, wouldn't you know it? <laughs> but you, you see where I'm heading, that, that it just, it, it there, were, there was a fork in the road and the Brits, the, the British folklorists went one direction and the rest of the folklorists went another. I think it's all coming back together very nicely. And, and uh, but, but there's still with well, the old, pre as I say, the old prejudice has lingered. If, I hope that makes sense. It's, it's complicated and very, I mean, I, I, we could talk for hours on that and put everyone to sleep. So if that, if that does it for you then. Oh yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, Be sure. Sure, my pleasure. Anyone else? There's still time. If not, I'd like to thank you very much, Ron, for your great talk and thank everyone for joining in and and uh and uh, I look forward to learning more. I think you gave us a really good initial background and then the, the questions that came in really emphasized what you were trying to get across, I think. So thank you very much. Can, can I just add a, one thing really quickly? Please, uh, go ahead. The first thing is that the book costs too much money. I mean, it's an academic book and they tend to cost too much money. It's kind of apparently gonna be out in paperback in, in July. So I hope it'll be more accessible in that way. I have posted one of the chapters at our favorite price, which is free on, uh, on my Academia EDU account. So if you Google Ronald M. James, academia.edu, you should find my profile page. And I have that and a number of articles on Cornish folklore and they're all free. Uh, the second <laughs> chapter on, on the droll tellers, on storytellers is there so you can you, you can always acquire that if you want. And please feel free to contact me if you wish. I'd be happy to uh, interact with you by email if, if you wish. And so don't hesitate. I'd be happy to answer more questions. It's, I, I'm in love with the subject and happy to share. Could you repeat the website again? Uh, it's, it's, it's Academia EDU, which is a place where, where stuffy acad academicians dump their, their papers that no one wants to read. Uh, okay. and, and so that's why so I go to that. And then if you, if you Google Ronald M. James uh, Academia EDU, you should okay. find my profile page. And then that has all my articles. Okay. So if, if you drop down to books, uh, you'll find chapter two there for 
for uh, the storytellers, as well okay, as all you. sorts of other things that will guarantee to cure you of insomnia. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. thank you. That's very kind. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for you. having me. I appreciate it. That's very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks. Yep. And you can see that Heather put down academia.edu so you can see what it looks like. And I look forward to that's it. Up. Thank you, Heather. So take care, everyone. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you very much. Thank you. <laughs>